One of the reasons I wanted to reteach this series, uh, after all, we, we did have this series on, on tape previously, and there was nothing very uh, terribly wrong with it. But uh, as I was listening to the old series, I realized that I must have taught it a few years ago on an occasion where, my, where I, I was uh, on the verge of laryngitis or something, because my voice was not its natural strength or quality on the tapes. I thought, well, uh, when, we have a lot of tapes like that, by the way. I teach so much, my voice goes out of me from time to time, and we have a lot of tapes in our library where my voice is uh, kind of on the edge or sometimes not, it's barely there at all. But I thought, well, that's, that's a good chance to replace that. And then, wouldn't you know it, today I wake up and I'm, uh, I don't, I wouldn't say I'm on the verge of laryngitis, but uh, uh, I do have a bit of a cold and I think I can, I can even hear the, the difference in my voice. So if one of the things that was going to be improved by redoing the tapes was the quality of my voice on the tapes, uh, that's, uh, uh, that's an expectation I'm going to have to adjust downward. But I hope, nonetheless, that we might have uh, sufficient strength of voice to get across those truths that will be of great use to us to know and to consider and to, if you already know them, to be reminded of. These are truths that Christians need to be reminded of frequently, I believe. And, of course, the series is called Making Sense Out of Suffering. And... Many years ago, I guess it was probably 1982 or 1983, it was one of those two years, I was uh, teaching for Youth of the Mission in Australia, and they had a connection with a Christian community, sort of a Jesus people community of several hundred people living in uh, nearby in Australia, and, uh, and through the YWAM contact, I was invited to go down and speak to this group. And uh, they, they were very uh, receptive and very thirsty for biblical teaching. And uh, I, the pastor asked me if there was anything I wanted to teach on. I said, well, is there anything you want me to teach on? He says, yes. And he gave me a long list of things. Uh, I was teaching every day and every night of the week for them. And he gave me a list of probably six or seven subjects uh, that he thought he'd like to hear taught on. And one of them he asked me to teach on was suffering. Well, uh, suffering was certainly not an unfamiliar subject to me, though I had never, to my recollection, prepared a, an outline uh, to present a systematic teaching on the subject. And so I did for him, that is for that pastor's sake, at his request. And I was glad later that I did. Uh, the notes that I prepared on that occasion, I, I presented in lecture form the same night. And it took about oh, a couple hours. These people, as I say, were hungry for the word and they didn't seem to get tired of listening to teaching, and uh, I was able to cover all the material that I'd written down in about two hours' time. Now, the reason I make, this, uh, make mention of this is because later on, I decided that I would like to teach the same material to our own school here in Oregon, and so I took the same notes, but without any time restraints, because I run the school, and I can take as much time as I want to, I just taught from the same notes ended up teaching four and a half hours, three, uh, three lectures of 90 minutes each from the same notes. And later still, uh, some time later, I was uh, teaching in Honolulu for Youth of the Mission for one of their schools there. It was not uh, for a DTS on that occasion. That's the schools I usually teach for, but I was teaching for their school of evangelism. And at the same time, a DTS, a discipleship training school, was in progress, and one of the teachers for the DTS took ill and in the middle of the week and couldn't finish teaching that week. And so uh, Danny Lehman came to me since I was already teaching for the School of Evangelism there and asked if there was, if I would like to fill in for the, the teacher who had taken ill and, and asked if I had anything I could teach that would be about a half a week long to teach. Now, half a week is probably six hours of teaching, I would say, in YWAM. In, in typical YWAM school, I'd say, uh, I'm trying to figure it out. See, there's ten hours and... No, a little more, about, about seven hours would be half a week of teaching. And uh, I thought, uh, okay, I, I, I uh, was thinking, well, maybe I'll teach Making Sense of Suffering again. And I did, and I filled the whole seven hours uh, easily. Well, after that, uh, Danny Lehman told me the DTS students had said that at the end of the school that was the best uh, week uh, and their favorite teaching of the whole school, and news got around about it. So certain YWAM bases began to ask me to come and teach whole week on the same subject, which in a YWAM base is usually 14, 15 hours of teaching. And there are at least three YWAM schools I went to and taught 14 or 15 hours on the same subject using the same notes, unmodified, that I had used originally to teach a two-hour lecture. Uh, and I have concluded 
from this experience that there is no limit <laughs> to how much can be said on this subject, at least by me. And, uh, <laughs> and it's interesting because I, I, it's not too surprising because uh, the points I make the points I want to bring to your attention are throughout the whole scripture. Illustrations, proof texts, experiences from my own life, experiences from Christian biographies. Just the material about suffering that is instructed to us and that is illustrative of the biblical teaching is immense. Uh, I was just looking today at some uh, handout someone gave me somewhere. I don't even know who gave these to me. I had them in my uh, manila folder under suffering. Uh, somewhere years ago, someone handed me these things, a bunch of quotes from famous people about suffering and someone else's outline on the subject and so forth. And I thought, man, this is all stuff. If I incorporated this into my lectures, I wonder how long I might go uh, with this subject and more. I mean, I, uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is the topic is, uh, the, the scripture is shot through with this topic and so is life. Suffering is universal and if there's uh, anything that Christians need a distinctive vision of that is distinctive as in contrast to the world's vision of the same topic it is this topic of suffering and it is in my opinion that it is in this area that is dealing with sufferings that Christianity's effect on a person's life is most dynamically and dramatically visible that is the difference between a Christian living and thinking and acting like a Christian and a non-Christian or anyone else who's not acting or thinking like a Christian is most clearly seen in the context of the handling of personal suffering. And uh, therefore, as I say, the, the amount of material that I could present is voluminous. Our last series was only four tapes by, by, uh, by, by my own self-limitation. I decided I would, I would require myself to cover it all in six hours and uh, so we had a formerly a four tape set I'm kind of hoping this will be a four tape set uh, I don't know uh, I, I, I'm going to put some limits on myself here and not go as long as I might you know I called it making sense out of suffering that's the title I gave the original notes back in 1982 when I first gave the first lecture now, I'd never heard that title anywhere I just thought it was a clever and uh, apt title uh, I later concluded it wasn't as clever as I thought when I found out that there are at least three Christian books out that have making sense out of suffering, either as their title or as a subtitle. I didn't know that at the time. I, never, I don't recall ever having heard the title, but I even thought I might write a book someday and call it Making Sense Out of Suffering, but I've decided against that since the three authors have gotten ahead of me on that and must be not so original and such a clever title as I thought, but it's still a good one. I'm holding on to it. I'm even going to hold on to it as original with me since I, I was using it before anyone else that I knew of was, but the reason I really stick with the title is not out of stubbornness, but because it is exactly, in a nutshell, what I'm expecting to talk about. How do you make sense out of suffering? And the problem is really twofold. One is, how does one make sense philosophically? How, uh, what do we do with the concept and the reality in the world of suffering in general? In the abstract, why is there suffering? The problem philosophically, of course, is aggravated by the fact that Christianity teaches that there is a God. And it teaches certain propositions about God. And by the way, the propositions that Christianity teaches about God, even non-Christians somehow instinctively feel like such things as these should be true of God. Namely, that God can do everything. God is uh, omnipotent. He is sovereign. Whatever God wants to do, he can do. This is a teaching of Scripture. And, and uh, the, another teaching of Scripture, of course, is that God is a good and merciful and loving God. So one of these propositions has to do with God's nature, his sovereignty. Another proposition has to do with his character, his innate goodness and mercy and compassion and kindness. Okay? Now, these two propositions actually are very nice propositions to hold both of. They're, they're very encouraging to believe that there is a God who can do everything and that he's a good God as opposed to a bad God who could do everything. That would be very scary. Those are comforting propositions, but they, they create a serious tension 
when one is contemplating philosophically the reality of suffering. Because it is often argued that if God is all-powerful and can do whatever he wants, and he could therefore prevent suffering, he could prevent pain and sorrow, but he does not prevent it, and he subjects his creation to pangs and agonies and uh, trials, uh, be, although he could as easily prevent it, but he simply doesn't choose to prevent it, then it is argued he is not a very good God. He may, th there may indeed be a God like this, they, it is said, I mean, in terms of logic and philosophy, there may well be a God who causes and controls all things and that everything that happens is exactly what he wants it to be, but it's hard to call such a God good in view of some of the things that he allows to happen and causes to happen. On the other hand, if God is in fact good and he does not desire people to suffer and he really wants everyone to be happy and comfortable and, and for things to go smoothly because he's a loving, compassionate, merciful God, then it would appear that he may not be as powerful as Christianity teaches because it seems as if he would want to prevent suffering and yet he does not. Is this what, what explanation can be given? But that he can't. He can't fulfill his desires. He's impotent. Now, these are the two prongs of a dilemma. These are the horns of a dilemma about a, a good God who's all-powerful. Nice thoughts. True, biblical thoughts. But how does one make sense out of suffering then with this basic worldview that there is a God who can do everything and can prevent anything he wants to prevent, and yet he doesn't prevent certain things that are very agonizing for people, and yet he's a good and merciful God. He's a loving God. And it is on uh, the horns of this dilemma that many, the faith of many people has been impaled. Uh, it is, in fact, one of the chief arguments of atheists. Uh, when I have heard atheists debate with uh, theists or with Christians, it never fails to be brought up as one of the strongest arguments against God, or at least against any Christian conception of an all-powerful and all-good God, that there is horrendous suffering in the world, which a good God would wish to prevent, and an all-powerful God could, and if he wished to and could, then he would. But he doesn't. And thus... Not only atheists, but philosophers and even Christians have struggled with this. How do we make sense of this reality in view of our Christian propositions and worldview? That's one sense in which I want to discuss how we make sense of suffering. But that's more abstract than what I really want to get into. I do want to address the question of how, how, this, how we can make sense of it in, in philosophically. But there's something more, and that's down pastorally and practically. How am I to make any kind of sense out of my own personal suffering? It's one thing to say, I can understand that there would be suffering in the world because of X, Y, or Z factors that I might conclude, but that doesn't necessarily tell me why I am suffering right now in the particular way and intensity that I am. Now, I'm, I say this as a person who's not currently suffering, but this is, this is where we need biblical and, and divine guidance uh, in understanding and making sense of things, because... There are many times when, uh, while we may have come to grips with the fact that there must be, or there should be, or there can be suffering in the abstract, yet in particular cases, our own especially, and those of the people we love and care about, we don't understand why suffering is occurring on this occasion. Now, we can sometimes, <clears throat> we can sometimes see a direct correlation between our own or another, or another person's actions and the suffering that comes upon the perpetrator of those actions, whether it's us or another, we can see exactly the, the, the relationship. Uh, I am rotting here in jail because I tried to smuggle cocaine into Turkey. You know, I mean, well, you don't do that. That's stupid and bad, and you suffer for that. And when you do, you can see that you don't, don't have any problem making sense out of your suffering then. You know why you're doing it. You know why it's happening. And you're wondering why you weren't smarter about it before. In fact, it makes more sense than, than an explanation of your earlier choices would make. But the problem is that people who are suffering aren't always able to draw a, a, a cause and effect 
logical relationship between the suffering they are currently enduring and anything they have done to deserve it or to bring it in any sense upon themselves. <coughs> in other words, it's harder to make sense of the suffering of innocent people than it is to make sense out of the suffering of guilty people. If people are guilty, we rather expect that they ought to suffer. But if they are innocent, it's very difficult to know why they ought to suffer. And usually, of course, the people, the innocent people, or the ones we judge to be innocent, whose, whose suffering is most offensive to us, is our own. We're always, not always, but frequently innocent in our own eyes. <clears throat> we can so often justify almost everything we do that's wrong, and having done so, it seems like our suffering that we may be enduring at any given moment is totally undeserved, or at least mostly undeserved, or it's disproportionate to what is deserved, or something like that. So, <clears throat> these are the things I want to tackle in this series. I want to talk about how we make sense out of suffering in the abstract, philosophically, in the cosmos. And then I want, I actually want to spend much more time, and will spend much more time, talking about making sense out of your own personal suffering. And not only making sense of it in the sense that now I understand, because sometimes you won't fully understand, but you can still make sense of it. You can still say, I can see how this, how God may, may be doing a good thing here. I mean, after we've talked about this, I think you'll be able to say, well, I don't know exactly why I'm suffering this particular thing at this time, but I can easily see that, that this may well be uh, purposeful and uh, something that is, uh, is a good thing to happen. But I want you to not only to come to an intellectual agreement that suffering can make sense, I want you to make profit from your suffering. And the only reason I do is because God wants you to. The reason that God allows his children to be chastened is because it's, it's for their profit that they might be partakers of his holiness. And therefore, to make sense out of suffering uh, goes further. Not just making intellectual sense out of it, but coming out with a sensible resolution, whereas you, you recognize yourself to be better off as the result of having suffered in certain distinct and observable, recognizable ways. Better off than you were before you suffered. And I want to say also, although I'll, uh, this is by way of preview to a later lecture in the series, there are ways that you can suffer and not benefit even when you could have if handling it differently, benefited from the same suffering. It is possible, according to Scripture, to suffer in vain. Now, that's an awful thought. I mean, suffering even for profit is not pleasant. But suffering for nothing, suffering all the same amount as if you were going to suffer for profit, and then to get no profit out of it, that is a, that is a, a grievous and bitter thing. And the Bible indicates that God doesn't want that to happen either. God doesn't want you to suffer in vain. If you're going to pay the price for something in terms of personal suffering, he wants you to have the commodity for which you suffered. But there are many who suffer the world over who receive no such benefit as God desires. And there are reasons for that. It is fortunate that God has given us the scripture because we might not otherwise know the reasons. And uh, before this series is done, I will have uh, brought to your attention what the scripture says about what you are, how you are to react to suffering the specific things that you can do and must do if you are to gain from your suffering. So this is where we're going with this, all right? Now, <clears throat> let's see if I can find some notes here. I guess um, <clears throat> on the first matter, the matter that everyone seems to struggle with who is a thinking person, the reconciling of a biblical view of God with the fact of suffering. How do we make sense of that? And there are many different ways of doing that. Of course, the atheist simply makes sense of it by saying the biblical view of God just ain't true. I mean, obviously there is suffering. And to the atheist, it's obvious that that's bad. And if that's bad, then it must be so that God is allowing bad things to happen. And that must mean he either wants them to happen, in which case he's a bad God, not a good God, or else he doesn't want them to happen, but he's powerless to prevent them, and therefore he... He's not a powerful God. He's not a sovereign God. And that presents to the atheist a very comforting basis for unbelief. And I say comforting because, of course, people are atheists for their own comfort. They're not atheists out of intellectual integrity, generally speaking, but they look for 
intellectual defenses for their preferred philosophy. And this is one that many of them find comfort in. They can sleep better at night if they feel that their disbelief in God is well justified by clear thinking. And uh, so that's the way that some people solve it. They solve it by just ruling out the God of the Bible. <coughs> of course, atheists just rule out all gods whatsoever, but, but they could, I suppose, uh, resolve it. I heard a debate between an atheist and a Christian not long ago, and the atheist brought up the point of, uh, you know, God, you know, responsible for evil, or, you know, I mean, if, if there's a God um, who's all good and all powerful, then why is there evil in the world? And uh, the Christian responded by saying, well, you know, it's interesting that you'd raise that point because the very judgment you make of God that he shouldn't allow suffering and that this is an evil thing presupposes some basis of good and evil by which you're judging God. And all philosophers know that there is no such thing as ultimate good or evil if there's no arbiter of good and evil, if there's, if there's no God or if there's no ultimate reality that's dictating uh, a standard by which we measure things that are right and things that are wrong. In other words, if there's, if there's no moral arbiter, which moral arbiter is some, for, is some form of God, if there's no such God, then anything is permissible. That's what Dostoevsky said. If there's no God, then all things are permitted. In the brothers Karamakov, or however you, Karamazov, or I, I never was good at pronouncing those Russian names, but the famous novel by Dostoevsky a uh, famous quote from it, if there is no God, all things are permitted. And this is philosophically sound, but the, the only reason it is, is that all things are permitted because no one can say that anything is really absolutely right or absolutely wrong unless there's some absolute arbiter or lawmaker that says this is wrong and any deviation, uh, this is right and anything deviating from that is wrong. And, of course, consistent atheists, which I'm not sure there really are any, but the hypothetical consistent atheist realizes that if he can get rid of God, he gets rid of moral absolutes. And that's largely what motivates a great number of people who are trying to get rid of God. They would like to get rid of moral absolutes because it, of course, takes all responsibility off their shoulders of fulfilling any moral standards. And anyone who's thinking knows this is true, that all suggestion, all defense of any moral standard as an absolute standard must presuppose the existence of a God who sets a standard or something transcendent to man, to which man is answerable, which sets standards. And since standards of morality are things of a personal nature rather than, a, say, something related to physics or uh, chemistry, uh, it's a moral thing, they have to do with personality, uh, therefore, any arbiter of moral standards must have a, must have an opinion, must be personal. It can't just be the 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 forces out there, the you know the chemicals and the and the atoms out there have determined that some things are good and some are evil. Uh, they can't make those determinations. Determinations of good and evil are moral choices, and moral things have to do with personality. Therefore, if there is in fact moral reality then there must be a personal arbiter who determines moral reality. And any such personal arbiter must be, in some description, someone's idea of a God. Whether the Christian idea is the right one or some other needs to be explored as a separate issue. But as soon as one admits that certain actions are clearly and universally wrong, they have argued for the existence of a God. <clears throat> and no atheist who is a genuine atheist can really say that anything is right or is wrong. The best that an atheist can say consistently is, some things I find undesirable, and some things desirable. Now, unfortunately, for society, if the atheist was true, that means that I do not find it desirable if somebody breaks into my house and steals my stereo. But I may find it desirable, if I can get away with it, breaking into someone else's house and stealing their stereo. And in that case, my stealing their stereo because I find it desirable is, in my value system, a right thing to do. Because it's desirable. Because it gets results I like, so long as I don't get caught and suffer consequences. Whereas, when somebody else does the same thing to me, that's not morally right, because I am suffering then, and in my value system, that's, that's not good for me to suffer. <clears throat> 
Now, the problem here, of course, is that if atheism were true, then there is no absolute standard by which anyone can be judged and all people judged the same way by the same standard, unless there's something above all people that sets that standard. And here's where the atheist gets in trouble, because the atheist says there can't be a God of the Bible because if he is there and if he allows suffering, then he is not a good God, he is an evil God. And in the debate that I I was talking about, I heard recently, um, the Christian made the point that there is, in fact, good and evil. The atheist himself admitted it by saying that God had, uh, you know, was, was doing something wrong. You can't say God's doing something wrong unless there's some standard of right and wrong that you're judging by. And why should God go by your standard? I mean, if, there, if he's God, he's not subject to your standard. There, you're suggesting there is something that everybody knows is wrong, and any God who would do that would be wrong to do it. And uh, the, the Christian made that point. And then the, the atheist, apparently, uh, like most atheists, apparently not being very intelligent, he, he missed the point entirely. He came back, he says, he thanked his opponent, he says, he says, you have not made a case for God, you've made a case for the devil. He says, you have not proved that there's a God. You've only proved that there's a devil. Uh, because he's saying, you know, any God that would allow all this is a devil, not God. And, of course, what he's implying there is you've still got the problem of an evil God. And the atheist missed the whole logical point. He was still perpetrating his own fallacy. To say that any God who would allow suffering is therefore bad because suffering is bad and everyone ought to know that suffering is bad. And therefore, he's a bad God. Therefore, he's not really so much a God as he's a devil. Is uh, Even to make that statement, is still judging from some standard of what what qualifies someone to be good or bad God. I mean, when he says a devil, what he really means is a bad God. A bad sovereign instead of a good sovereign. But you can't make that judgment unless there is a good sovereign from which the evil deviates. Now, I don't want to get overly philosophical, but what I'm saying is that the atheist solution to the problem is an inadequate solution because it's self-contradictory. You can't argue that there cannot be an all-good and all-powerful God because there's evil and uh, because there's sin, uh, suffering and suffering is evil. Because without such a God, you couldn't determine anything to be evil, and you couldn't even critique. Well, uh, you couldn't make a decision about whether suffering is good, bad, or indifferent. Is it good that a cow dies and you eat a hamburger? Depends on whose point of view you're looking from. From the cow's point of view, it may not be considered a good thing. From the vegetarian's point of view, it may not be considered a good thing. From the carnivore's point of view, it's very good. There's a trade-off there. A little bit of suffering on the part of the cow exchanged for a great deal of pleasure on the part of the person who killed and ate the cow. How can one assess the moral rightness or wrongness of the cow's demise? Well, only by some standard... We can't, you know, we can't say, well, if I were a cow, I'd have to say this was evil. As a person who eats meat, I don't think it's evil. That means that good evil is, is something that di- differs depending on who you are. It's all subjective. Whether you're the victim or the benefactor, uh, or I should say the beneficiary of the, of the act. So there, there, this would suggest there's no absolute good or evil. A thing is good or evil as you like it or don't like it. As it pleases you or doesn't please you. As it benefits you or doesn't benefit you perceptibly. And this, of course, makes everybody the arbiter of his own set of good and evil standards. And there's no reason why any God should be judged by an individual atheist's opinion of what he thinks is unpleasant. After all, maybe squashing atheists like bugs gives God his jollies. You know, I mean, why shouldn't he call that a good thing to do? The atheist can call it a bad thing to do, but he only does so on the basis that he doesn't like it. But that's not a basis for a moral standard. That's a basis for pragmatism, but it's not a basis for arguing any morality. And by the way, the atheist in the uh, debate I was referring to a moment ago actually was willing to say there is no moral standard. And he said that the only reason people don't go out and rape and kill and do all kinds of horrible things uh, unrestrained is because we're informed by enlightened self-interest. And that whereas uh, at a certain level a man may take some pleasure in committing adultery, at another level... He would have great displeasure if he was caught and suffered consequences and that a husband killed him and things like that. So he, he doesn't commit adultery. And therefore, standards of behavior are arrived at by the idea of ultimate benefit or loss to individuals in society and, and that all moral systems are only uh, delusional. 
They're simply a matter of personal and social consensus. And that's what the atheist comes up with. But the Christian said then, the Christian argued that no, things like molesting children and raping people and oppressing people and, uh, you know, doing horrible things, like, but they are in themselves wrong things. And, uh, of course, the atheist had no basis for, in fact, for affirming that. In fact, he denied it. Of course, he didn't tell whether he happened to like to molest little boys or not. Uh, judging from his behavior, I wouldn't be surprised if I found out he did. But, uh, he, but he was certainly not willing to admit that, uh, you know, any, any perversion was truly wrong. It was simply inconvenient for society and therefore preferable not to be allowed. Well, of course, if there is no God, that's very logical. Unfortunately for humans, that makes us all nothing else but animals who only are delusional and think we know that certain things are wrong, but really nothing really is. Well, that's not a solution that real, intelligent thinking people will ever settle for of this crisis, this, this conflict between the presence of suffering and, and the concept of God. Chad, do you have something to contribute to this? Yeah, where does society come up with the laws? I, well, he would say they just learn by evolution. You know, I mean, when when these uh, ape men began to live in colonies and caves and so forth, they found out that, uh, you know, if a guy slept with his neighbor's uh, female, that he probably got himself knocked over the head with a club, and, and they lost too many members that way, so they made a law, don't anyone sleep with each other's females. And, uh, and you know, honestly, I'm sure that that's how it was. You know, they've, they've, I mean, that's how an atheist would understand the evolution of moral standards in society. But let's face it, the atheist has more problems than just this, but this one uh, certainly doesn't get him out of trouble. It gets him into trouble, this dilemma. And his solution is simply not possible to reason for. Then there are those of, of a religious sort, and even in Christian circles, who solve the problem by changing the biblical concept of God. If you can't have an all-powerful and an all-good God and suffering, and no one denies that there's suffering, then what is left to us is thought is to deny either that God is all-powerful or that God is all-good. You could still have a God in that case. You could still have a God who may be all-powerful and not so good, or all-good and not so powerful. In the body of Christ, sadly, there are theologies that actually take one or, of, or the other of these positions. The most notable uh, position that, that, that compromises the sovereignty of God or that compromises God's ability to do anything would be those of the Word of Faith camp. If you're not familiar with it, these are the people who say that God doesn't really want you to be sick. He doesn't want you to ever suffer poverty. He really doesn't want you to suffer anything except some Word of Faith people will admit persecution. You can't get, very much get away from what the Scripture says about persecution. But they feel that anything other than persecution, any kind of suffering, is certainly not the will of God. And, uh, and God doesn't want you sick. Now, of course, they have, they're faced with the reality that people are sick. Even Christians are sick. Even some faithful Christians are sick, and some die that way and never get healed. And therefore, what, what do they make of that? You've got the suffering, and yet you've got, in their mind, a God who is so, as they would interpret, good, that he would never approve of suffering, Therefore, their answer is, the devil causes all suffering. That you should never blame God that somebody, you know, uh, coughed on you and you got pneumonia and, 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 got, and lost several days or weeks of work, suffered a financial problem because of it and so forth. Uh, don't ever blame God for that. That's the devil does that. God doesn't do that. And I remember I got a... <clears throat> A, a tape in the mail from a, a guy, a pastor, Word of Faith pastor. Uh, I'll probably tell this story also in our Word of Faith series, but, but this is a good illustration of the concept. I, I, we have our growth books, you know, that we send out. And one, one pastor actually ordered several growth books and then read them and sent them back uh, with, with a tape of one of his own sermons. And uh, there was something in the growth book about God shaking up the church and sifting out uh, you know, the, those who are not uh, sincere and, and so forth. And I, I basically said in the growth book that uh, these are things that God sometimes does. And I quoted scripture to prove it. 
but this fellow had a theology that nothing that is undesirable, nothing that is unpleasant, uh, could be from God. And he sent back the growth books. He was very cordial. He actually sent a donation with him just to know there were no hard feelings and said, you might be interested in this tape of a sermon I, I gave. And, and he uh, sent this tape called Don't Blame God. I recognized the title because Kenneth Hagin had a booklet by the same title. And, it's a, and uh, so the man's sermon title wasn't any more original than my Making Sense of Suffering title is, but, uh, or at least not as unique to him. But I listened to the tape, and it was typical Word of Faith stuff. The idea was that, you know, if bad things happen and you suffer as a result, don't blame God for that. God didn't want that to happen. He just couldn't stop it because the devil's there. And the devil messes things up for you. And uh, if you don't have enough faith force, if you can't manipulate the powers of faith and the law of faith, then God is powerless to stop the devil. The devil can just rule the universe, as it were. At least you rule your circumstances. And therefore, anything bad happens to you, God is a good God. Now, by the way, I agree with that statement, but that, the way it is understood good in that faith system, I have to differ with. But they say God is a good God. He would never want his children to suffer. Old Kenneth Copeland, in one of his books called The Adversary, he said that some people believe that God allows the devil to bring suffering in our lives and God approves of this at times for our discipline and for our improvement. He says that's like saying that uh, I as a father have a, a Doberman pincher and when my children misbehave I unleash this, this attack dog to tear them up. Some father. Well, that's what they say. And so his argument is there can't be, uh, God can't in any way approve of suffering because that would make him cruel. And he's not a cruel God. He's a good God. And so here we have one way of resolving the problem. You've got a good God, but not very powerful. He's a God who can't really prevent tragedies from happening if you don't have the, the law of faith that you're operating in. And uh, God may really wish for you to live, but unfortunately the devil wants you to die and, and uh, God can't always keep you alive. I remember this man on his tape spoke of a, a recent death that his, uh, of a child that his wife had had. He and his wife had, uh, uh, had a child die apparently at birth. I didn't know the circumstances. He alluded to it. He was talking to his church. They knew the circumstances, so I had to kind of read between the lines. But they had had a child apparently recently before this tape was made, and the child had died either at birth or shortly afterwards. And he says, you know how I made it through that. You know how my wife and I gained strength in that trial? He says, as soon as we realized that the child was taken, he says, we said, God is not in this. This is the work of the devil. And we were able to therefore maintain our faith in God through the crisis because we remind ourselves that God is not in this. Now, when I heard the tape, it had not been very many years since I had lost uh, a wife in an accident. And I thought, how different these people are from me. Because when the paramedics told me my wife was dead, my first thought literally was, God is in this. And that's where all the grace came flooding into me. I, I, I said, this is, God has a purpose for this. This is God's will. Now, you see, the, the word of faith person would say, no, no, that, that makes a very ugly and cruel God. We can't have that. Who would want a God like that? And that's a bad God, not a good God. That's the devil. But I say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. If, if God really didn't want my wife to die at that time, and here she's a Christian, and she's serving God, and she's trusting God, same as me or you or anyone else, and, um, and the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and so forth, and, and uh, you know, God's doing all he can to protect her, but the devil got through against God's will and killed her anyway, ended her ministry, ended her testimony, brought great inconvenience and sorrow to her loved ones and so forth. The devil was able to do that even though God didn't want him to. What comfort can I have in that? That God may be for me, but when Paul says, if God be for us, who can be against us? There's a very obvious answer. The devil can be, and boy, you better be afraid. It seems to me that when Paul says, if God's for us, who can be against us? That's supposed to be unanswerable, because the answer is nobody. Nobody can effectively be against us if God is for us. Why else ask the question? And... Uh, you know, my comfort comes from the fact that although I don't always know what is the cause of the suffering, or that is the reason for it, I, I always know that there is no suffering that happens to me except God willed it. It may be God's plan A or it may be God's plan B, but God willed it. 
when I say plan A or plan B, I, I will say that if I'm suffering and I've done absolutely nothing wrong that I can think of, and I'm not suffering as a result of anything I've done wrong, I would have to say that this is God's plan A suffering in my life. He's, he, he brought it without anything that I did wrong. But if I'm suffering for things I've done wrong, I do something wrong and I'm suffering, I'd say that's probably plan B type suffering. God preferred I didn't do anything wrong. I might have suffered in one way or another anyway in his purposes for, for my own good, but, but uh, it would have been totally in the perfect will of God because I didn't do anything wrong. If I do something wrong and I suffer for it, it still may be God's will that I be chastened for I did wrong. I learn not to do that anymore. But it's not really his preference that I had done something wrong in the first place. It's like, well, okay, I'm suffering as a consequence of something I did, but that's still God's will in a secondary sense. It's corrective suffering. Anyway, I may be getting ahead of myself. What I'm saying is that is one way that some Christians try to solve the dilemma. How can there be suffering and there be a good God? Well, their answer is he is a good God, but he's not a very powerful God. God himself in that theology is subject to laws that he can't violate. He's, he operates through the law of faith. The law of faith stands above God, and he has to operate in it just the same as you or me. And uh, in, in essence, if we operated as well as he did, we'd be little gods too. We'd be just like him. In fact, some of them go so far as to say that's exactly true. We are little gods. God knows how to operate the law of faith, and he can create universes. If you learn how to operate the word of faith, uh, you can create universes too. You'll just be another god. That's all he is. Somebody who operates under and through the law of faith. Well, sorry, uh, I, I don't go with that. But, but the point is that that, it, that does provide a, 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 a diminishing of the dilemma. It does explain how there could be a good God and suffering too. It just, doesn't, it just sacrifices the sovereignty of God is all. And it's, it, of course it sacrifices any, any security that we could possibly have. That, you know, we're safe in his care because he's not you know he may like us a lot but he can't do anything for us if the devil comes after us and if we're not doing the right thing in terms of making positive confessions all that stuff so there's really very little security to be had there um, but then again truth doesn't always have to satisfy our desire for security I mean we should prefer truth over security if it's a choice to be made and if the word of faith doctrine were true I would live with the insecurity and just say at least I know the truth but it isn't true uh, we'll find that out clear enough as we study that doctrine separately and as we study suffering in general. The other extreme position Christians take would be that of what we'd have to call the hyper-Calvinist, and Calvin himself was a hyper-Calvinist because he held this view, and that is that, yes, there is a God who's all-powerful. Yes, there's a God who's all-sovereign. Yes, there's a God who causes everything to happen. Every sinful choice was ordained by God. Every murder, every rape, every child molested, was, it was ordained by God because nothing can happen but what God ordained. He's totally sovereign, totally in control. But we have to take a little sacrifice here on the idea of him being good. Now, they wouldn't say he's not good, of course. They'd say, well, he's a good God. We just have to accept that by faith. Luther, in his book, The, the uh, Bondage of the Will, he, he said, you know, this, he says, this is the supreme test of the faith of the Christian in the goodness of God. That we believe that he ordains all things, even sin, even wickedness. He even, he even works in the sinner to make him a sinner and then sends him to hell for it. He says, this is the supreme challenge to the believer's faith in the goodness of God. You bet it is. If that's true, that is a, a, a very su significant challenge to my faith in the goodness of God. I mean, uh, fortunately, the Bible doesn't call me, on me to believe such nonsense. But that is another solution to the problem. Why is there suffering if there's an all-powerful God? Well, there... He's all-powerful, but he's not good in the sense that we usually think of goodness. Now, he may be good in some mysterious abstract sense that is not described in Scripture or in common sense. I mean, we could say it may be in some way that's mysterious. God's never explained why it's good that God has made, uh, you know, uh, babies be uh, raped and so forth and dismembered and, and suffer uh, cancer and so forth. And all these things that may be in some mysterious way. Uh, uh, good for a God to just make that happen because he's pleased to make it happen. But we would have to revise our understanding of good. I, even, even we'd have to revise it from what we would normally get from Scripture. That is, if we derive a concept of goodness from what the Bible generally teaches about what's good, bad, and so forth, and then we believe that God does such things unilaterally just because he's sovereign, that's all there is to it, then we'd have to say, in calling God good, we have to come up with a whole new category of definition of what's good. 
because we're saying that God is good, though he does things that if we did them, they'd be called bad in the Bible. That things that God would condemn us and send us to hell for doing, uh, so that there's one moral standard for God and another moral standard for godly people. And this is a strange thing to suggest in view of the fact that the Bible indicates that Jesus was the perfect example of God and that we are required to walk even as he walked and be followers of God as dear children uh, to suggest to us that God's behavior is actually not exemplary. That God's behavior is really, though it's good for him, it'd be very wicked for us. This is where we get in trouble with, a, with a, a, an over, over extreme hyper Calvinism. And by the way, in my opinion, any Calvinism uh, that is uh, taken to its logical conclusion is hyper Calvinism. And therefore, once you get on that uh, conveyor belt, it takes you inevitably to the same spot. Once you decide that God's will is the only will in the universe that really determines anything, then you just can't escape the fact that not only did God decide who got saved, but he also decided who got lost and why and, and, and destined them to do so and destined them to do the wicked things that got them lost, etc., etc., so that God becomes the author of sins. And, and uh, frankly, Calvin didn't shrink from this at all. In his, in his writings, on, uh, in uh, Calvin's Institutes of the Christian Religion and also in his book, The Predestination of God, The Eternal Predestination of God is the title of the book, uh, he didn't shrink from this at all. Modern Calvinists are squeamish, and they don't like to admit this kind of stuff. But Calvin was smarter than they are. He knew that if you accept these points, you cannot logically hold back from going all the way to these other points. The only way you can be a Calvinist and not a, what's now called a hyper-Calvinist, like Calvin was, is by ceasing to let your beliefs follow their logical course. In other words, you have to sacrifice your rational uh, thinking. And I, I'm sorry, any Calvinist listening to me might might object to my saying so, let them write to me, or better yet, let them debate me. I'll be glad to uh, be confronted about this, but uh, anyone who's looked at these things clearly and doesn't have an axe to grind and isn't sacrificing the rational powers can see that if you, if you accept the true, accept, accept as true the basic propositions of any true Calvinism, you end up, by necessity, a hyper-Calvinist. And therefore, you have not sacrificed God's omnipotence but you have certainly sacrificed his goodness if we are to define goodness in the sense that the Bible generally describes goodness and lays out goodness as a pattern for Christian behavior. Because the Bible says in James, to him that knows to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. If there's some good deed, if there's a, 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 a beat up Jew at the side of the road and I'm a Samaritan uh, going by or, a, a, or for that matter a priest or a Levite, if I don't help that person, if I don't do everything in my power to relieve that person, then, according to that parable, I don't love that person. That, that parable is about love. And uh, therefore, if I do love a person in the way that God commands me to love them, which is, by the way, the model of love that I'm supposed to follow is his model of love, according to Scripture. Jesus said, love one another as I have loved you. So, uh, my love that I'm commanded to have is supposed to be exactly like his love and not any different. Yet, I'm supposed to believe on the Calvinist system that God sees a great number of beat up people alongside of the road that he could help, but he just chooses not to. Like the, the priest of Levi, he just passes by on the other side and only helps those few that he chooses to call the elect. If I made that kind of discriminating uh, love in my behavior, I'd be sent to hell for it, according to Scripture. Anyway, there is a problem of a sort in, uh, in trying to make sense out of why suffering exists and yet the Bible teaches these two propositions about God. Let me tell you um, my attempt at a solution of the problem. I come at it uh, maybe a little differently. In some respects, my solution is much closer to that of the Calvinist than it is to that of the word of faith people. You know, these people solve it by going to one or the other pole uh, on a continuum of possibilities. My view is very much closer to that of the Calvinist than that of the word of faith person. But as you know, I'm not a Calvinist, and there are distinctions that I would very be, be very glad to make clear what those distinctives are between what my, I understand and what the Calvinist teaches, or what Calvin himself taught. But here's what I understand. When the philosopher says, 
there is a dilemma here. If there is evil in the world, that is, if there's suffering in the world, then there, the God who exists, if there is one, must be either not all powerful or not all good. Now, suppose I said, well, I affirm that God is all powerful. He can do whatever he chooses to do within the perimeters of his policies that he has set for himself. That is, things that are consistent with his character, that are consistent with his overall purposes. And his purposes are for good. He, he desires all men to be saved, for example. He wants us all to be sanctified. He wants all of us to live forever um, with him. His purposes are good. In his overall purposes... He is capable of doing whatever he wants to do, and there is no restraining his hand. He is a sovereign God, not sovereign over everything that the Calvinists sometimes claim, but sovereign in everything that the Bible says he is sovereign over. Now, having said that, what do we do with suffering and the goodness of God? Well, the only reason there would ever be a challenge here is if we assume that suffering is not good. If we do not make the assumption that suffering is not good, then there is no problem. If we can allow that suffering may be good, then the dilemma evaporates. How could an all-powerful, all-good God cause suffering? Well, that depends. Is suffering good or bad? The problem hinges or rests upon, I should say, the a priori assumption that suffering is not a good thing and that an all-good God could never permit it or want it. And if it could be, if, if you could just tilt your, your vision just a little bit and say, well, wait a minute, who says that suffering is necessarily not a good thing? Then you suddenly have dissipated all objections to the God of the Bible. Now, let me ask, is suffering good or is it bad? Is suffering good or is it bad? Well, that's not, um, that's not a strictly either or, or statement. There's, we have to say suffering, most suffering, is rather complex. Suffering is found in actual experiences and events. <coughs> Suffering isn't just something that's written on a chalkboard and talked about in the abstract. Suffering is something that is really experienced. And in every experience of suffering, there are complex factors, a multi multitude of factors in some cases. But, for example, in many cases, I won't say every case, in many cases, the suffering of an innocent person is caused by the criminal actions of a, of a bad person. Now, if that is the case, and that is not always the case. A person may suffer from natural disasters or from health problems or some other things besides uh, criminal activity. But let's, let's just take that as, a, as an example. If an innocent person suffers at the hands of a guilty person, is that suffering good or bad? Well, <clears throat> uh, seen from one side, it certainly is bad because the guilty person is doing a bad thing. That person is not doing what God would prefer for them to do with their life. That God would prefer that that person would repent, give up their criminal behavior, stop victimizing people, and be a good person. Now, one area that the Bible says that God is not all-powerful about is that he can't just make people be good unilaterally. He appeals to them. He woos them. He twists their arm a little bit. He puts the thumb screws on applies pressure, he can do many things, but he cannot just unilaterally say, be good, and it was so. You know, um, That is one area that the Bible does not make any claims for God's sovereignty in that particular aspect of human behavior. And therefore, God retains his innocence, as it were. Uh, he is not the cause of uh, evil behavior. But that's not really what we're... I'm not talking about the origin of evil or the cause of evil, but the cause of suffering here. What I'm saying is that the person who inflicts suffering unjustly on another is doing a bad thing. And as such, we must condemn that behavior. And we could say that suffering is a great tragedy in such a case. An innocent party has suffered. At one level, it's a tragedy. At one person, that person at level, that person's life has been disrupted, perhaps killed even, or at least greatly, greatly inconvenienced, maybe traumatized, uh, maybe a lifelong handicap as a result. 
I mean, some very tragic things result. And no one wants to suggest and sh- or should suggest that everything about that experience is good. But while it may be a bad thing that has caused it, if we believe that God is sovereign in the sense not over the choices people make, but over the results of their choices. And the Bible certainly teaches this. God does not make the choices for you, but he does determine whether your choices will bring about such and such a consequence. For example, a person may decide that, let's say, let's just say theoretically 40 people band together and say they won't eat or drink until they've killed the Apostle Paul. Did God put that choice in their heart? No. He didn't. They made that choice by their own wicked free will. But God determined whether their plans were carried out successfully or not. God does not determine what they will decide, but God determines what they will ultimately succeed in. And that being the case, we can say that if an innocent person suffers at the hands of a guilty person, God did not put it in the mind of that guilty person to do that wicked thing. And there is evil in that suffering, but God is not the author of that evil aspect. But God is so marvelous and so good that he is able either to prevent those evil designs from being realized on its victim, which has often been the case in history, or to transform, to allow those designs to be carried out and transform the experience into a positive, beneficial experience to the person who is the intended victim. Now, I'm not suggesting to you that everybody who's been victimized has benefited from it. I said that earlier. It's not the case. But I am saying the Bible teaches that everyone who's been victimized can, if they, if they have a distinctly biblical and Christian approach to their suffering, every person can benefit from their suffering. This is uh, so thoroughly and frequently taught in Scripture that it seems to e- evaporate the legitimacy of any charge that suffering is necessarily evil and must be a work of the devil, etc., etc. Yes, some suffering is caused by evil, by either the devil or by people who are very devilish. Not all suffering is. Some suffering originates from other uh, immediate causes. But, but the fact of the matter, even if evil is a factor, the, the net result for the person who is trusting God and who is who, who responds to suffering in the way the Bible instructs us to, is a good thing. Now we decide, is this good or is this bad? Is it good that suffering happened? Or is it a bad thing? Well, one thing I'll tell you, if you look at Psalm 119, we'll get uh, sort of an answer to that question. <clears throat> Psalm 119, and verse 71 <clears throat> the psalmist said, It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. Now, the psalmist does not tell us what form his affliction took. If this was David, and we don't know whether it was or not, it may have been the affliction he suffered at the hands of Saul or of Absalom or of other enemies. If it was some other a psalmist, we don't have any way of knowing. Maybe he was sick. Maybe he, uh, maybe his his uh, reputation was destroyed by gossips. I mean, who knows? Affliction is simply suffering, and we suffer from many causes and in many ways. <clears throat> what I can say, though, is that the psalmist, if I, if you ask the psalmist, is suffering good? Is your suffering? Let's be more personal. Is your suffering good? Is your affliction good? He can say it's good for me. The people who caused it may not have been doing a good thing, but it was good for me. You won't find me complaining to God or saying, God, justify your behavior here. Explain yourself. How can you a good God make? It's good for me. God doesn't have to give explanations of why he does things that are good for me. And I can believe, in fact, that had God not wished to do this good thing for me, it would have not happened. And regardless of the intentions of wicked people who may wish to inflict suffering upon me, it will not happen unless God allows it. And, uh, and by the way, we have no way of knowing how many times every day potential affliction threatens us because the devil or some wicked person would desire to do us hurt. 
and because the angel of the Lord encamps around the righteous and delivers them, we, we never learn of all the times God said, no, I don't want them to be afflicted in that way right now. No, I don't want them to suffer that right now. No, I'm not going to let that happen. But on the occasion that God says, okay, this time I'm going to let them suffer, we can know that it's a choice he made out of a sovereign position. And, according to Scripture, out of a position for our good. We know very well the Scripture in Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good to those who love God and who are the called according to his purpose. If everything for me works together for good, how can anything in the final analysis be called bad? or Bad in the sense that how could good God allow this to happen? I can say there may be bad factors. They're not the factors that God introduced into the picture. The bad factors are those that sinful men introduce in the picture. But the event itself, which is the suffering that, that is so hard to understand, the actual event of suffering is something that God ordained or else would not have permitted. Now, you see, how does, you might say, how does that differ from the way you characterize the Calvinist and criticize them? Let's take the example of uh, a child suffering some horrible abuse. I indicated that the Calvinist doesn't have a very good God because the God of the Calvinist causes that. And yet you might say, Steve, what you just said indicates that though God doesn't cause the abuser to think uh, uh, and to plan the abuse, that it happens in the will of God or else because God could have prevented it. And therefore, do you still have a good God because he could have prevented but did not prevent such abuse? How does this differ from the Calvinist position? Well, precisely in this way. Calvin and Calvinists that agree with Calvin, such people are now called hyper-Calvinists, they believe that not only did God allow the person to be abused, but God put it in the heart of the abuser to abuse. There is a difference here. God put it in the heart of the abuser. God created the desire in the heart of the abuser and made the decision for him because God ordains all things. God ordained on this view that Adam and Eve would sin. God ordained that all, you know, that all sins that are committed were, would be committed. It's God's doing. God authored this book. He wrote the script and everyone just plays out the script. So God is not only the one who on occasions allows children to suffer and others to suffer innocently, but he's the one who authors the whole idea of abuse and, and affliction and sin against other people. You see, my view, which I, I certainly believe is what the scripture consistently teaches, is that the sin comes from, is originates with man, not with God. God does not put it in the heart of an abuser to abuse, but once he finds it there, he determines whether to allow this to happen or not. And he does so on the basis of his love for all parties concerned, especially for the innocent. Now you might say, well, that doesn't make sense. If God loved the innocent, why would he let them be abused? That's what we're getting at. Is abuse, is the suffering of abuse inevitably bad for the abused person? Let's face it, it often is. But if we could see that God has informed us that if you, if you receive suffering in a certain spirit, in a certain, with a certain biblically uh, described and dictated response, that your suffering can be transformed into glory for you. That your suffering can work all manner of desirable things in you that you could not have if you didn't suffer. Now, the suffering of the innocent, as I say, doesn't guarantee they'll benefit, but it gives them the opportunity to benefit. If they do not benefit, again, it's not God's fault. If you don't like bitter medicine and you've got a disease and I force you to take bitter medicine, and therefore, you can potentially get better, but you go and stick your finger down your throat and vomit out the medicine because you refuse to take the medicine, then you may not benefit. But don't blame me for giving you the unpleasant experience of swallowing it. If God gives you a marvelous opportunity to ascend to, to a, a position of glory and a position of spiritual benefit, and if you do not use it and therefore do not benefit, don't blame God that you didn't benefit. 
It may be the case that we can lay the responsibility for the uh, event in one measure happening to you. You can say, well, God allowed that. God must have wanted me to endure some kind of hardship in this situation. But the result of benefit or not is really for you to decide. You see, God is not the only actor. He has the last say about actual circumstances in the world. That is, men can decide to perpetrate suffering on others, and those who suffer can decide whether they will do the things that will cause them to benefit or not from suffering. Those are factors. But God is the one who decides whether the suffering will actually be permitted to occur in his universe. He allows it to happen. Now, is that bad or is that good? Well, it depends. It ends up being good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose, but it doesn't end up being good for everyone, but that's really, in a sense, their fault. Now, someone's going to think that was a very terrible thing for me to just say because they'll think of some horrendous situation of someone suffering innocently in some country where there's no food and there's disease rampant and there's civil war and, and innocent children are, are you know being uh, horribly... Uh, their lives are being ruined. Someone's going to say, and Steve Gregg said it's their fault. No, I didn't say it was their fault that they experienced suffering. It is every person's responsibility, though, to benefit or not from suffering. It's not their fault that they're suffering. Don't get me wrong there. God may allow people to suffer, but God knows what good thing can come from it if they will benefit from it. And that very largely depends on the individual's choice, which is exactly why you will find two parties, two old women, both of them Jews who suffered in, in Auschwitz, and one is embittered, nasty-spirited, and another person who went through the same experience is sweetened by the experience. Is a, a Cory ten boom, you know, I mean, becomes a saint. Why? They were in the same prison camp. They experienced the same sufferings. One was made better, and the other was made bitter. What determines the outcome of suffering? God doesn't determine the outcome. God determines whether suffering will be permitted to enter this person's experience at this time. There may be many who want it to, but God can say no and not let it. If it does, it's because God has not prevented it, and that's because he has a purpose, a good purpose for it. The question of whether they become bitter by it or better by it is not his to make. It's theirs to make. It's our responses to suffering that determine whether we benefit or not, whether we profit from it or not. But for God to put it out there as something that you can profit from is not any challenge to his goodness. That's actually a confirmation of his goodness. The psalmist said, it's good for me that I was afflicted. All things work together for good. Even sufferings work together for good to those who love God. Look at Hebrews chapter 12. By the way, there's uh, very possibly scores or hundreds of scriptures that we will end up looking at as we go through this series. But I'm just going to give you a few that, that make the particular point I'm talking about right now. Hebrews 12. Verses 10 and 11. Well, actually, that's part of a larger discussion. I probably should give you the larger context. Let's go all the way back to um, verse 5. You have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens. And he scourges every son that he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which you have all become partakers, or all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them, but he does it for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but grievous. 
Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Now, chastening, the word chastening in the Greek here does not always mean painful chastening. Sometimes we think of chastening as specifically referring to spanking and inflicting pain, but that's not necessarily the meaning of the word in all cases. In uh, Ephesians chapter 6, the same Greek word appears uh, where he, Paul, Paul tells fathers to bring their children up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, to nurture children, to bring up children, is what the Greek word for chastening means. It, it, it has to do with the whole enterprise of child raising, not just what we would call discipline. But um, in this particular context, it's clear that he's talking about that aspect of child training that, in, that is the infliction of pain, that involves discipline against the child's will. And we know that that's clear here because he says no chastening seems joyful but grievous. He's talking about un the unpleasant part of being parented as a child. Uh, you do something wrong and you experience punishment. You experience discipline, uh, imposed discipline. And this is not, generally speaking, pleasant to go through. But is it good or is it bad? You see... The problem with human beings is we're so self-centered, we determine what's good and bad by what we personally like or don't like. Instead of having some greater uh, transcendent basis for deciding that something is good or bad. If I don't like it, it's bad. That's humanism. That's, that's making yourself the center of the universe and the moral arbiter of all things in the universe. Can't do that. The Christian has already decided that I'm, he is not the center of the universe. God is. And therefore, decisions about what is good and bad must be based on what... What goals are achieved? What is the end result? Is it a desirable one in the sight of God or not? And for that matter, if a person is truly a Christian, what is desirable in the sight of God is also desirable in my own sight. What is the result of chastening? It's unpleasant. It's grievous. But what is the result? Well, those who receive it are partakers of his holiness. They are, what's it say, they, 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 it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness, those who are exercised by it. Is that desirable? Well, it depends if you're a Christian or not. Non-Christians probably don't have much use for that. God certainly does, and Christians who are godly do. Christians, in other words, who think correctly and whose minds are brought into alignment with the reality that God has revealed think, hey, this is a good thing to be a partaker of his holiness. That's, what, that's a hard thing to do, by the way. I've been trying to be holy for a long time and keep missing the mark. There's a promise here. I can be a partaker of his holiness. Don't tease me, God. I really want that. Don't just lead me on. I really crave that, to be a partaker of his holiness, to have the peaceful fruit of righteousness in my life. That matters to God, and that matters to a true Christian. And therefore, if the chastening, unpleasant as it is, has the potential to produce the fruit of righteousness and true holiness, then I'm in no way going to view that whole experience as a bad thing. Unpleasant, yes, but that's different than bad. Something has got to be judged as good or bad in terms of its final outcome and the desirability in the largest scheme of things, to the highest set of goals, it's desirability of achieving desirable goals. And if holiness and true righteousness are, in fact, desirable goals, then we would have to say that chastening is a good thing. Now, let me ask you this. If, if a man comes at you with a very sharp knife, and he comes at you and he's going to cut your stomach out and take out some of your organs, is that good or bad? Well, that depends, in a way. It depends. What if he's a surgeon? You know, I mean, if he's a mugger in an alley, we'd have to say, well, that's bad. I don't want that to happen to me. If he's a surgeon, you probably still don't want it to happen to you. But if you need it, you'll be glad he's there to do it. You're not going to call in the police after and say, arrest that man. He just cut me open. You know, he's doing You're paying him to do it. There's probably a policeman in the building. And he's not at all afraid of being arrested because he's doing what all regard to be a good thing. It's, this, in a sense, uh, in days before there was anesthesia, fortunately we have that now, but in days before anesthesia, for a surgeon to cut a person open, and they did, by the way, would be every bit as painful as for a mugger to do the same. But the experience 
although the, the feelings involved and the painfulness and the suffering involved would be identical, in either case, the goodness or the badness of the act has got to be judged by the final outcome. Is a person killing you and taking your money or is a person saving your life and removing cancerous tissue? Makes all the difference in the world. How could a good God, an all-powerful God, allow there to be suffering? Well, in a perfect world, there would need to be none. And the Bible speaks of a future time where there will be a perfect world. And what's it say about it? There will be no more sorrow, no more pain, no more death, no more crying. Why? Because it will be a perfect world. And in a perfect world, God doesn't have to do surgery. In a perfectly healthy body, you don't need a person with a knife coming at you and cutting you up. But we're not perfectly healthy all the time. And the world and our spiritual state is not perfectly healthy. It's interesting, the writer of Hebrews says, we, we allowed our fathers, we didn't have any choice, but we, we, we respected our fathers who disciplined us, but how much more should we reverence the father of spirits? Why is he called God the father of spirits? Because our earthly fathers disciplined our outer person, our outer behavior. God is disciplining our spirit. God is fathering and nurturing and developing our spiritual well-being. He's fathering our spirit. And if the thing that he does, unpleasant, painful that it may be, he intends for it to produce something good, spiritually, eternally. If that can be affirmed, if that is true, then all of a sudden that suffering is no longer capable of being seen as a bad thing. Only an unpleasant thing. And so we need, first of all, to break free from the natural tendency to think of what is unpleasant is bad. But we know better than that in other realms. We know that uh, a person who uh, has to take bitter medicine uh, finds the experience of bitter me medicine very bad, very unpleasant. But they do it voluntarily if they believe that some good thing will result in terms of better health. When a person wants to build his muscles and he joins a, a gym and he goes and works out with weights, he desires to bring pain to his muscles. He'll feel like it's a wasted workout if he leaves and there's no pain. You know, there, the expression, no pain, no gain, that's, that's a, a weight lifter's expression. If you don't tear those muscles enough to make them hurt, they're not going to get any bigger. Now, as far as whether having big muscles is important or not, that's a separate issue to discuss separately. But, but the fact is, to the weightlifter, that's a desirable goal. He wants his muscles bigger, and he quite gladly goes to the showers after the workout feeling every muscle burning in pain. Now, if you wake up in the morning and, all, and you're experiencing muscular pain in every muscle of your body, you probably call in sick and don't go to work. You know, I must have a flu. This is terrible. Because you don't, first of all, you, maybe it isn't your goal to have big muscles. And if it is, it may be that you didn't get your pain by exercise. And you didn't, you, you may have the pain, but no gain. You may have the pain in your muscles, but no bigger muscles for it. But to the weightlifter, he, he is exercised by that pain. And he receives the result that he's seeking. Everybody knows that making sacrifices is a part of, of uh, achievement and success and improvement. There's a person who goes to school for eight to ten years to become a medical doctor or some other kind of professional. Why? Well, he, he either, uh, he's got some goals. Maybe he's a philanthropist, wants to help humanity. Maybe he just wants to make a lot of money. But in any case, whatever his goals are, he makes the sacrifice of eight to ten years of his life. Studying, spending money, going into debt to the school and so forth so that he can reach the goal. That's while other people who don't share his goals, they're out there maybe partying or they're already out there married and raising a family and, and uh, in a job that they'll enjoy for the rest of their life or whatever, but they're not making the sacrifices. They're not suffering the disciplines. But that doesn't bother the medical student or the law student. I mean, there may be times when it's burdensome. I'm sure it is. It's got to be. But he does it for the joy that is set before him. He endures that particular uh, discipline, that, that particular suffering. 
The idea that suffering brings about something of value is known to us in all other fields. People value pearls, for example, but we know that pearls are caused because of irritation. A grain of sand gets into an oyster, the soft tissues are irritated, so they secrete some kind of a thing, some kind of a substance that surrounds the sand, and when it hardens, it becomes a pearl, and people consider those things great value. But we all know that they wouldn't exist if the, if the oyster wasn't irritated. There are valuable things that are the result of pain, and in God's sight, there are spiritual gains of infinite, eternal value that are had only through the medium of suffering and cannot be had any other way. In the course of these studies, which I'm going to have to wind down this first lecture, in the course of these studies, we will find that the Bible lays out many benefits when we look at them. And I point them out to you, you you're going to think, you're going to start wanting to suffer more. You know, uh, there, there are things that you can gain only through suffering. I'm not saying you're going to become a masochist. Self-inflicted suffering is never, uh, well, I shouldn't say is never right, because some kinds, you know, weightlifting, yeah, that's self-inflicted suffering, I guess. But let's just say, to, to learn to take some kind of kinky pleasure in suffering is not what's advocated. It's not biblical. That's, that's kind of twisted. Uh, but to uh, rejoice in suffering, not because the suffering itself is being enjoyed, but because afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness, and you can rejoice in that in advance, is Christian. Some people might not know the difference between that and being a masochist, but there is a difference. Because the Christian does not enjoy the suffering, but he can rejoice in the suffering. Because he knows the suffering is only for a while, and afterward he can be a partaker in God's holiness. And therefore, it is a welcoming of sufferings in the will of God. A Christian doesn't go out looking for additional sufferings outside the will of God, but when they come in the will of God, the Christian doesn't say, how could a good God do such a thing as this? Where is God when I need him? A Christian says, well, here's another, here's another chance to go forward. Here's another chance to improve, and I haven't yet laid out for you what all the areas of improvement are, but we shall, and the Bible has much more uh, things it says about this than you may have imagined, unless you've studied it out yourself. Let me just say in the last few minutes we have here, that in order to make sense of suffering, it's, it's probable that we should uh, understand the different categories into which suffering falls. There are, uh, as far as I know, three different categories of suffering that Christians experience. On the one hand, there is suffering that we experience because we do wrong. God chastens us because we are his children. And when we do what is wrong, God doesn't want us to keep that up. He doesn't want that to become a pattern. And he chastens us. He brings certain suffering upon his people when they go wrong to teach them not to do that anymore. The psalmist said, it's good for me that I was afflicted. I might learn to keep your laws. In 1 Corinthians 11... 1 Corinthians 11, Paul is talking to the church that has been irreverent at the Lord's table, has, has uh, lacked the fear of God, and has profaned uh, the holy institution of communion. And he says uh, in this matter, in 1 Corinthians 11:30, 30, he says, For this reason, that is because of their misbehavior, for this reason many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. He goes on to say, for if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned with the world. Now he says, the church has suffered. Some people are sick. Some are weak. Some have even died. Why? He says, it's for this reason, because you profane the Lord's Supper. You've been sinning. Therefore, God has judged in these ways. But he says, but when we are judged, we're being chastened by the Lord so that we will not be condemned with the world. He doesn't want us to keep this up. If we keep up this sinful pattern, we'll have to be condemned with the world. So he intervenes, just like a, a father or mother disciplining a child. So some of our sufferings can be made sense of by simply recognizing this. I, I deserve this. I brought this on myself. I won't do that again. You know, I'll learn my lesson. No better next time. That is what we could call the chastening of the Lord. We suffer because we did what was wrong. Another form of suffering that Christians suffer is just the opposite. Suffering for doing what's right. This we could call bearing the cross, putting up with persecution, even martyrdom if, if necessary, uh, abuse, uh, uh, verbal abuse, physical abuse, ostracism, rejection from man, 
Things suffered not because we do what's wrong, but because we do what's right. Now, there's a sense in which this makes sense also. Because in 1 Peter it says, Brethren, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. It's not strange. He tells you why it's happening. He says in 1 Peter 4, 1, Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind, for he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. What he means is, if you're suffering at the hands of man, as Christ did, it's because you're not going with man in their sinful way. You've ceased doing that. You're not doing that anymore, so you're getting in trouble with their sight. He explains that. That he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime doing the will of the Gentiles, when we walked in licentiousness, lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. In regard to these, they think it strange that you do not run with them and to, in the same flood of dissipation, and they speak evil of you. You're suffering because you're not running with them anymore. You're suffering because you're doing what's right now instead of what's wrong. We could just, if we wanted to label this, in contrast to the chastening of the Lord, we call this cross-bearing. We're bearing the cross. We're bearing the reproach of man and of the devil because we choose to do what's right. That's another kind of suffering we suffer as Christians. And a third kind, I would just call common suffering. And this is where we've neither done anything particularly wrong or particularly right to bring our sufferings. Our sufferings are not caused by our right behavior or our wrong behavior, but they're just general sufferings. Uh, if we wished we could play golf, but it rained today, well, that's a mild form of suffering. It's hardly worthy to be called suffering, but it's unpleasant, and people are, suffer disappointments. But it didn't rain because you were bad, or it didn't rain because you're good. It just rained because it rained on this whole town today. If a hurricane blew through here and knocked down every town, Christians would see their houses fall just like non-Christians. It wasn't because the Christians did something right or wrong. That's just from falling in a disordered world. We live in a fallen, disordered world. And things are not as they should be. This is a diseased world. And we experience some of the effects of that disease. If an atom bomb was dropped on Portland, we'd all probably die. So would a lot of non-Christians. have nothing to do with your righteousness or your unrighteousness. We could call that just the common sufferings that come upon all people, including Christians. But even these can be turned into glory. If we suffer a necessary suffering in a Christian way, it can be turned into glory. I have an interesting quote here from, um, uh, I think it's from George MacDonald. Well, I don't know if I have a quote here or not. I thought I did. It had to do with if you receive uh, necessary sufferings in a godly way, it can be credited to you as if it was uh, you were suffering for righteousness. And I think that is a sensible thing to say. I just don't remember now where the quote is. Uh, anyway, the point is that we may suffer because we do right, we may suffer for doing wrong, or we may just suffer for being human in a world that where humans suffer. The first two forms of suffering can be avoided. You can avoid the chastening of the Lord by judging yourself. If we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. If we are judged, we're chastened by the Lord. But if we judge ourselves, we wouldn't have to do that. If you behave, God won't have to discipline you. On the other hand, you can avoid the cross too. All you have to do is compromise. All you have to do is not be righteous. If you do what the sinners want you to do, they'll stop picking on you in many cases. Christians can avoid two forms of suffering that they experience. They could avoid the cross by compromise, which is, of course, never okay. Or they can avoid chastening by doing what's right all the time, if they can pull that off. But Christians cannot avoid all suffering because, as humans, we still live in a world of suffering. And the common sufferings that all people suffer around us will still touch us in the will of God. And this is what we need to uh, reckon with. Suffering is for all men. Job said man is born to trouble as sparks fly upward. That means as surely as sparks fly upward, that surely man's born to experience trouble. You'll experience trouble. The question is, what will you do with it? Will you make sense out of it and make profit out of it? Or will you just be embittered and confused and, and uh, lose faith over it? Well, that's some th things we're going to be discussing. Unfortunately, we are not left to conjecture. The Bible is, has an immense amount of light on this subject, which we will be exploring in the remaining lectures of this series.